Okay. We're good. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Michelle Dunn. I'm the Executive Director of Franciscan Action Network. And I want to welcome all of you to the first in our four part series confronting environmental racism. Uh, I want to start by thanking our co sponsors for the series, the Franciscan Federation and the Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creation Office of the Order of Friars Minor. Um, we're really uh, glad that so many of you are, are with us today. And as always, we want to open with prayer. I'd like to welcome Sister Pat Millen of the Franciscan Federation to offer an opening prayer. Thank you, Michelle, for that kind introduction. And as we said, let us begin in prayer. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that it gives. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Help us to respect and renew the earth. We pray for the waters of our nation, that they may be restored to health and filled with bountiful life. We pray for Earth's soil, that its richness be protected to assure abundant harvest for all. We pray for all creatures who share Earth with us, that their beauty and diversity will be preserved. We pray for our brothers and sisters in our nation who have been and will be directly impacted by the effects of climate change. We pray for future generations. May they learn from our environmental irresponsibility and be good stewards living simply and in harmony with all your creation. We pray for all human beings that we will be filled with a spirit of concern for the future of our environment, bring an end to the exploitation of the earth's scarce resources and live as responsible stewards protecting and respecting this gift of God's creation that God has placed in our hands. We pray for wisdom for decision makers in Houston, Texas and our nation that they make amendments for the harm they have done to the environment and find creative and just solutions to protect all of creation and ensure climate justice. All powerful creator God, extend your loving embrace on all the people of Houston, Texas who have been exposed to petrochemical toxins and are at risk of losing their lives because of the monetary greed and profit of the oil and gas industry. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Pat. So um, this is the first in a four part series um, of monthly discussions to learn about, about environmental injustice and racism. Uh, we all know that, that uh, climate change and environmental degradation, it affects all of us. It affects all people on this planet. It affects all Americans. But we also know some people are affected a lot more than others. And in this country, that's particularly Black, brown, indigenous, and poor communities who are disproportionately affected. And that's what we're here to learn about. Um, we need to know a lot more about this and we need to find out what all of us who care about it can do to address the situation. So um, we decided to that we would take this new series of mini documentaries by Hip Hop Caucus, called Big Oil's Last Lifeline as the jumping off point for our discussions. 
So in this session and the next two of our four sessions, we're going to screen each one documentary, which they're about 20 minutes each. And then we are um, really blessed to be able to bring, uh, we have invited speakers, people who are living in these communities and who are activists in these communities to it be in discussion with us for us to learn more from them. Um, so today, in today's session, we are going to, uh, oh, and in the fourth session, actually, we're going to discuss advocacy, advocacy and action and strategies to address the issues surrounding um, environmental racism. In today's session, we're going to screen the first one of these um, documentaries, which is about Houston, Texas. And we're really lucky to have with us for conversation after the film, Yvette Ariano, who is a Houston-based environmental justice activist. And Yvette will discuss with us what's going on in Houston and also what all of us can be doing. So we're going to start right now, uh, uh, just to lay out the hour for you, we're going to first view the 20 minute documentary, then I'll have a little bit of a conversation with Yvette and then it will be your turn, the participants to submit your questions for Yvette. We'll have a, a good bit of time, I hope for a discussion and then we'll close again in prayer at the end of the hour. So uh, we are uh, ready, I think, to go ahead and, and screen the first film, and then we'll come back after that and have our discussion. Enjoy the film. Petrochemicals are chemicals derived. The toxic practice of the petrochemical industry is negatively affecting us all, and our environment and climate is drastically changing. Petrochemical plants and refineries emit 10 to 15% of the U.S.'s carbon pollution that is driving climate change. We are the consumers in which these industries continue to profit from. The petrochemical industry produces plastics, fertilizers, pesticides, gasoline, cosmetics, fashion, and a plethora of more chemicals that are a part of our everyday use in this society. These chemical plants have strategically been placed in what are called sacrifice zones, predominantly along the Gulf Coast and Ohio River Valley, putting black and brown people and poor communities at risk of environmental, health, and economic hardships, and too often, causing death. Greatly known for their entertaining rodeos and delicious barbecue, Houston, Texas is a beautiful city and has a diverse community that expresses a common demand when it comes to being exposed to toxic chemicals. They want to live in a safe environment. Some of the most impactful voices who are on the front lines of the environmental and climate justice movement gives us a look into the life and injustices that they face daily when it comes to the petrochemical industry in their beloved city of Houston, Texas. And although some may have different cultural backgrounds, they stand in unity when it comes to fighting for environmental and climate justice for all. My name is Yvette Ariano. I live in Houston, Texas, in the community of Magnolia Park, and I'm the founder and director of Fenceline Watch, an environmental justice organization based in the east end of Houston. I got involved in environmental justice from a really young age. Being really young, we would go and pick all the fruit, all the herbs, and we were taught how to harvest and how to plant our own food. Growing up in Houston was always really warm. There was always a place to call home. Yeah, I am uh, Reverend James Caldwell. I am the uh, founder and director of COCO, which stands for Coalition of Community Organizations, and that's here in Houston, Texas. We're going back a bit, <laughs> okay. But uh, now, life growing up here in Houston, the community I grew up in, which is Fifth Ward, uh, was fun. It was a united community. Everybody knew one another. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm one of seven children, and everybody in the neighborhood was our parents. <laughs> our working relationship with uh, EDF, Environmental Defense Fund, TSU, Texas A&M has enabled us to 
get community members, which we refer to as block captains. It's our data to action plan. I'm Grace T. Lewis. I am a senior health scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund. I started working with COCO a few, like 2019, to give them the data to help make it actionable in their work to address environmental justice, long-standing environmental disparities, health disparities, issues that have been systemically burdening communities in the Houston area. Chemicals like creosote, a compounded mixture of multiple chemicals that is produced at the petrochemical plants and used as pesticides and wood preservation by Union Pacific Railroad is having a harmful effect on the residents of the Fifth Ward as Union Pacific continues to dump the toxic and hazardous chemical waste contaminating the community's soil, air, and water. These petrochemical companies are responsible for continuing to make and sell this dangerous carcinogenic chemical, even though it was banned in homes in the United States and considered a cancer-causing product in 1985 by the EPA. It is now only used for commercial use. My name is Sandra Edwards. I'm a resident of Fifth Ward. I am a Fifth Ward block captain. I have been for two years now, and we go out to sample the soil and the water in the community to make sure that we are safe. I am Dr. Danae King, and I am the Associate Director of the Bullard Center uh, for Environmental and Climate Justice at Texas Southern University. One project that we're doing is collaborating with the Environmental Defense Fund and Texas A&M University, as well as with the Coalition of Community Organizations with Reverend Caldwell in the Fifth Ward community and his phenomenal block captains. We've been doing sampling as it relates to PAHs and, uh, some, and some other heavy metals, uh, particularly for the creosote contamination. With preliminary data, it suggests that we are seeing PAHs in the soil across the Fifth Ward community. At a public town hall meeting, residents from the Fifth Ward were given their final opportunity to express their concerns about the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ, granting the proposed renewal of a 30-year permit to Union Pacific Railroads, which will allow them to continue dumping the toxic chemical creosote in the Fifth Ward community. Childhood leukemia in the Fifth Ward is five times greater than the state's average. Unfortunately, Latanya Payne's 13-year-old son, Corinthian, lost his five-year battle to this vicious disease. Uh, Corinthian, um, he was a child that loved people. He had a big heart. Um, he had a desire to become a chef when he became an adult. Um, he loved to cook dinner for us, you know, as he became older. Um, and he just loved family and friends. So he was initially diagnosed with leukemia in 2016. And then he went through the three years of uh, chemotherapy, three and a half years, and he was in remission and he was doing good. And then he just started complaining of pain again, which was the initial uh, symptom that he had in 2016, you know, just dreadful pain. We made several trips to MD Anderson and that's when we found out that, you know, the leukemia had returned. This grieving mother, also discovered that she would have to battle cancer on her own shortly after the passing of her son, Corinthian. So I was diagnosed with a triple negative breast cancer on the right side three months after Corinthian in 2016. And um, so I went through my rounds of chemotherapy, radiation, and lapectomy, and Everything was fine, Every, doing my annual mammograms and following with my oncologist. And then um, September 14th, I had a, a mamma, my annual mammogram and they found something on the left side this time and it's the same triple negative breast cancer. You just sit up here and tell us that it is not coming out of your fence. A fence don't stop nothing. 
I am very angry with Union Pacific Railroad for the environmental injustice that has been going on so long in this community that has affected so many in this community for having to experience the loss of a child and what he endured going through this chemotherapy treatment and the regimen of chemotherapy and even with myself you know, the emotional distress, the physical distress, Union Pacific, I, I'm appalled. They look at us for our color, they look at us for our poorness, that we don't have the money or the economy coming in like they do. They look at the area we stay in, they just look down on us. That's our challenge, they don't look at us as humans like everybody else, they look down on us. And if they say they don't, they're lying because you have shown us better than telling. You don't have to tell us. It's your actions show us how you look at us. So the challenge is you look at us as if we are not, we don't deserve. We don't deserve the same as everybody else. And that's not right. We're human too. Imagine your home being a few feet away from a chemical plant where a chemical spill or explosion can happen at any moment. The foul odor of these chemicals is so intense and potent in these neighborhoods that it's impossible for residents to enjoy being outside. The smell is strong. There's no way to escape it here. People in frontline communities, fenceline communities are always just like, our community is so quiet, you know, nobody's outside, people leave you alone. Nobody wants to be outside. You know, you can see the tops of these things. They're not safe. They catch fire. You can tell from the char, you know, folks are right next to these things and they're up in flames. In the, in, in Pipwood, uh, on a given day, one train can block every entrance uh, except for one in Pipwood. These are bomb trains and everybody knows these large black trains as bomb trains because we know they carry chemicals. And it's all going back to the fact that Houston and the Houston Ship Channel is the largest chemicals port in our entire nation. These chemical plants have no limits, even when it comes to kids. Right here, this is Unidad Park. And that's another pattern we see in our communities is just, there's a refinery, there's a park, there's a refinery, there's a park, there's a chemical plant, there's a park. And right after Hurricane Harvey, this park had kids who were just, you know, skateboarding, and we let them know that the flares are toxic and they should probably shouldn't be out here, but, you know, they're just kids. This is the playground that our kids play in here at Hartman Park, and, you know, you can see that the partnership is with Valero. This is a mural that's left. It's not even that old, but it's what kids in the community see the community as. So I know these look like pools and everything, but these are actually the storage tanks that were right across from the Contanda ones that hold thousands of barrels of chemicals. It's images like this that let you know that kids see the problem. Most residents in these vulnerable communities have no choice but to shelter in place when there is a spill or explosion because there is nowhere else for them to go. What is the evacuation route? You know, that's something that we've always struggled with here too because it's not like shelters in place don't happen here. They happen multiple times where folks are told, you know, go inside. We go inside, we close the windows, doors, shut off the air conditioners, put plastic all over everything. But for how long can we stand that in temperatures like today that are gonna get in the 90s and the 110 degrees? Chemical leaks and spills are more common than you think from these petrochemical plants. Recently at Lyondale Bissell Chemical Plant, two workers lost their lives and multiple workers were hospitalized after a 100,000 pound spill of acidic acid was released.
When spills such as these happen in places like Galena Park, Baytown, or Manchester Park, where there is a heavy population of a Spanish-speaking community, the language barrier can make getting the message to the people difficult, being that most of them do not speak English. Getting information out is one of the biggest issues for Baytown. So if there is something like a chemical fire or a release, the first people to know about it are always going to be, you know, high resource neighbors and it's never going to be, you know, your Latinos who have language barriers. It's not going to be your historically black communities. It's not going to be folks who live in the apartments. It's going to be folks who have more resources, who speak English, uh, predominantly white communities. A lot of times people are actually outside, either washing their car, doing laundry, or mowing the lawn, like things that you do every day. Meanwhile, in the background, you have these big old black plumes of smoke, and you got to question yourself, you know, what's going on and why aren't I being told what's happening? Environmental racism always seems to show its face when it comes to the petrochemical industry and the black and brown poor communities. Communities like Fifth Ward, like Pleasantville, um, like Manchester, they are the ones where they've been there for a long time and industry has just grown up around them. Most families living in these low-income communities do not have access to health care if or when they become ill. This is a way of life for residents in Manchester Park, Fifth Ward, Baytown, and countless other communities in the Houston area. The negative health and economic effects that the petrochemical industry is having on these communities by producing these toxic chemicals is beyond heartbreaking. Uh, sometimes, depending on how close the, the um, source, the industrial source of pollution might be, uh, whether or not there is some contamination maybe in groundwater uh, and also soil contamination. So these, those kinds of exposures then lead to, to things like um, asthma, respiratory illnesses, uh, lung cancer, so uh, leukemia, cancers that are specifically associated with some of the benzene and toluene exposures. We don't know what's coming out of the flares, so it could be a cancer-causing chemical. It could be something that causes hormone imbalances, something that affects eyesight or causes low birth weights in pregnant women in our communities. If we have a chemical explosion or a release, I'll get rashes again, like in the back of my neck, and I'll have to use steroid cream that was actually given to me by another environmental justice organizer because but we don't have insurance or medical care. The water over here is bad because I had rashes in my neck and my back. I used the cortisone time I get out the shower. You shouldn't have to time you take a bath. The last a chick bath is supposed to clean you, not burn you. This is this is how I have to put on my body time I get out the shower to keep from breaking out blisters. It, it gets so bad it blisters. It swells up and it has pus coming out. It's on my back and my neck. If I don't use this when I first get out the shower, and this is not from dry skin, this is not from, this is from the water. It's acid in our water. Seeing eye to eye is a common ground when it comes to stopping these petrochemical companies from polluting their neighborhoods. No matter what their background is, these Houstonians are coming together for one goal, and that is to make sure that they get justice in the fight for a clean and safe environment. We know that there have been these institutional systemic um, environmental racism, climate justice, lack of equity to a lot of communities that really need to be addressed. Um, and how do we use that data to number one, assess you know, what is causing the disadvantage, where do we need to allocate the resources, and how do we direct um, the policies to the people who need it the most. And the enforcement would then make us, uh, I think, a better, a, a safer 
community. And it may also encourage our petrochemical companies to, you know, convert to cleaner technologies and really think about how, how to make the transition to a much safer uh, and cleaner way to, to do what they do. News recently broke that the petrochemical plant Lyondell Bissell is set to permanently close in December 2023. Being an advocate, we don't run away from fires, we run to fires to get the reality of what's going on on the ground. And with that, I know that as someone who is yet another person that doesn't have health insurance, I'm putting my life at risk every single day. The doctor told me, you most likely won't be able to have kids. That alone has given me the drive, anger, passion, love to continue doing what I'm doing. We need people to vote. We need them to uh, put into office people who are dedicated and committed to environmental justice, climate justice, to protecting the people who are at greatest risk and most disadvantaged, people who are dedicated to uh, making improvements and changes, positive changes for the communities that live next to industrial facilities. With the support of Houston's Mayor Sylvester Turner and United States Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee on hand, the community finally felt like they were not in the fight against the giant corporations alone. And I'm here today speaking on behalf of the city of Houston that we stand in opposition to the hazardous waste permit. This proposal. The idea of our commentary is to be able to show to the state of Texas that there is absolute unity on your behalf. Absolute unity. You've heard from the mayor. You see the representatives that are here. Now, on behalf of the United States Congress and the 18th Congressional District in particular, I have to stand in opposition to the draft permit being rendered at this time. Our local officials and our state government have stepped up. They did something I had never seen them do. They came together and they fought for us, for the residents. While accomplishing some wins on their mission for a clean and safe environment, these Houstonians are motivated to keep fighting, knowing that there are more battles to conquer. We get together, we come as one. It's not a such a thing as Fifth Ward, Cashmere Garden, Denver Harbor. We are one. And we're gonna go and we're gonna stand and we're gonna fight against the people that's contaminating us and poisoning us. My name is Eva Sherrill, Kat Tucker, Josie Damian, Dr. 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 Dustin White. And I will continue to fight for environmental, environmental climate, climate, and, and racial justice, justice until, until we can all, all breathe again. Uh, I hope you agree with me about how, how powerful these films are. And um, so now I'd like to welcome Yvette Ariano, um, a Houston-based environmental justice organizer who founded the group Fenceline Watch. Yvette, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I'm gonna ask Yvette a few questions, but you, the participants, you get to ask questions too. So I want to invite you now at any point, just put them into the chat just put your questions into the chat throughout the discussion. They're gonna go only to our communications coordinator, Janine Walsh, and Janine will, will bring the questions forward in a while. So you won't be um, you know, interrupting the conversation. So um, Yvette, again, welcome. Thank you. It's, um, it's amazing to be able to have you with us in real time um, after seeing that film to um, to, to go a little deeper. And I want to start, Yvette, by just inviting you to tell us your story and what brought you to the environmental justice activism that you're involved in now. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thanks to, to FAN for having me on. 
uh, with you all for this. Every time I see that film, it's kind of like it, uh, it hits a little bit. Um, so my name is Yvette Arellano. Apologies for that. My name is Yvette Arellano and I live, uh, work, and have been in Houston, Texas for my entire life. I'm a first generation Mexican American and English is actually my second language. Um, I'm the executive director of Fenceline Watch and our core goal and mission is to eradicate toxic multi-generational harm, uh, which is what we experience first and foremost. I live in a frontline community on the east end of Houston and at the mouth of the Houston Ship Channel that spans about a 52 mile stretch. So at the beginning of a 52 mile stretch of over 600 uh, petrochemical facilities and over 250 what's called risk management plant facilities. So those are the kind of facilities that can uh, explode. And what brought me to this work was one, not knowing how I was affected uh, by all of these industries. You know, I grew up with oil and gas, Exxon, Chevron, um, and, you know, even uh, ConocoPhillips going to my schools and giving us everything from, you know, small supplies to um, free backpacks and the community stuff that they're still doing now. And then, you know, for my family, I don't think there, there's one person in Houston, Texas that isn't touched by the energy industry. My dad, his entire life worked as a janitor for Shell um, and Chevron. And so I know this is not necessarily his dream of me taking on the industries that helped employ him and so many millions of others in Houston. Uh, but I was surrounded by it, the culture, everything from marathons to Thanksgiving to uh, the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo that also was able to, to help me, you know, pay for my studies was all, you know, was all on the periphery. I lived around oil and gas culture. It was seen as a culture and not so much as propaganda. And you can only imagine how magnified that is in a state like Texas that is red, that is an energy state, that is in the South, that is governed by someone like Governor Greg Abbott, who openly uh, fights against climate justice or even the idea that uh, our climate's being impacted by these polluting facilities. So it's always been there, it's always been in the background. And uh, when Occupy, uh, Occupy Wall Street around 2011 uh, had really risen up. It really gave a, a brand new breath of oxygen into so many of us who had these kinds of feelings like we are definitely being oppressed, we're being polluted, and it helped create connections with other organizers, other folks uh, who had these feelings and, and gave us a sense of, of community similar to the Franciscan Action Network. Uh, where we could share and talk about the issues most affecting us. So it's always been there. And, and around 2011, it really got fueled. Um, but even in previous positions, I, I worked at a Boys and Girls Club, you know, a local community center that works with children. And at some point, we found ourselves stocking so many medications that we didn't have any room to put our lunches um, during the summer months. So that on top of seeing children in the community as little as three-year-olds, you know, passing away and attending their funerals, that's something nobody wants to see. And it changed my perspective. You know, before I used to think you, you, you have to be good, you have to go to school, do good in school, go to college, do good in college, get a job do good at that and you know just be a generally good person but that changes when you see a three-year-old who can't make it who didn't even start school or when you see people in the community my friends um folks who work at the community centers who struggle with the same reproductive issues that that i have so we don't, we aren't even given the opportunity to bring life into this world 
because we're stopped before we can even attempt. So it was like a number of different things that affected my life and created a, a bigger sense of belonging and a better sense of understanding over how I was affected that uh, drove my passion into this work. And at the back end of 2020, uh, pushed me to start leading this work in a way that I felt was just to the community, especially uh, migrant populations and, and women. To tell us a little bit more about what, what Fence Line Watch does. You, you just told us that, it, that, that the mission is to eradicate toxic multi-generational harm. Um, from the petrochemical industry, but tell us how you do it. What's what? What are what does Fenceline Watch do? How do you address this? It's a great question. Uh, so right next to me, we have one very important piece of equipment. I know you can't see the whole thing, but it's um, a theater projector, uh, similar to what you would see at a professional production. So. We use a number of different tactics. We believe in multi-pronged organizing that includes direct action. So in the um, era of the pandemic that we're still in, we were definitely searching for distributed action styles. Uh, and so projecting on buildings in downtown or on facilities, different things, including, you know, we're in Texas, right? Climate justice is real or um, just transition now for cities like Houston where we can't afford for cities like Houston, the fourth largest city in our nation to become uh, um, uh, what we saw happen after the automobile crisis, right? Um, so we do distributed actions, we do banner drops, we speak to our representatives both here in the state and in DC, we work on policy and legislation. And we also, our most passionate work is involved with directly interacting with our personal communities and trying to bring folks out to speak out against these new facilities that are coming into our backyards and adding to an already existing problem. Because it's very easy for a facility to come to a place like Houston or along the ship channel for any of the neighboring cities and say, yeah, we're gonna be here because there's already a pollution problem. So one community member can't point to our facility and say, you poisoned me when there's already, you know, like I said, over 600 different entities that we have along the ship channel. Um, so the work we do is multi-pronged and we do it in the safest way possible. And we engage as many people uh, like the Franciscan Action Network, like student groups, uh, moms groups, and even our local civic associations that we're very much a part of uh, to try and inform, spread information, because I think that's what's missing, uh, that missing puzzle piece is people want to do something. They just don't know how or who to contact where their voice can actually make a difference. Um, I just want to ask you one more question, Yvette, because I, I think we have a lot of a lot of people who are <laughs> eager to ask you questions. But, you know, watching the film and hearing what you're saying, um, you know, it's really heartbreaking that the health effects are so devastating, you know, with contaminated soil, contaminated water, contaminated air. And um, you have become very active. And as we saw in the film, there's, you know, different people and organizations working in coalitions. But why aren't there even more people active? I mean, what, uh, you know, what, what holds people back from, from really speaking out on this issue, especially when they themselves or their family members or community members, they see, you know, suffering, as I said, these devastating health effects. I think everyone was able to see how the Trump administration was able to mass spread misinformation throughout the country and how it was able to lead and take charge and not only redirecting uh, the truth behind science, you know, things that we learn in grade school, uh, but all of those tactics already existed. And if anybody has family or right now is in the South, you know it's alive and well. 
So these networks and groups and the types of misinformation tactics exist still in places like Mississippi and Louisiana. You know, we see it in Appalachia growing in Texas. And when these types of, of groups are able to foment information, then it makes it up to the national level. So they're alive and well and definitely existing. And so what that does is it, one creates a counter narrative to all the science, right? It says, no, nah, don't worry about that. Climate change isn't real. We saw that now most people hopefully understand that's a lie, but then there's the very dangerous part of not knowing, right? That's when things become insidious. So if you don't know you're being exposed to something like lead or cancer causing benzene or any number of chemicals that people are familiar with, PFAS, right? Teflon in cookware that we grew up with. We didn't know that this was dangerous to us. We kept it around us because it was sold to us. And so what we were buying was a problem that was going to exist and create everything from health issues and concerns for us, ourselves, and also for our family. So that's the fact of not knowing and not having the information has been the most insidious part where there are so many chemicals that are generated every single year and the science can't keep up with it. The EPA has been very open about how delayed and backtracked they are uh, with something like uh, something called TOSCA, toxic substance. Um, reform. And so for our community members, you know, they say, if it was dangerous, wouldn't someone have told me? Won't someone tell me if my house is on fire? And unfortunately, with current regulations and how they stand and how states like Texas fight against protective measures for the sake of the bottom dollar, what we have is a lack of information. And so the people, my neighbors, my community, you know, similar to all of us here, when you talk to someone, the first thing they're gonna say is, well, why am I still alive? You know, well, my question back is, do you have any health concerns, right? Are you dealing with something? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you struggling with diabetes? you know, uh, cardiovascular issues? Do you have, you know, I've met someone who had a nerve replacement who finally connected with another person in our community that had a similar nerve replacement surgery. And yet the idea was, well, you know, it could have existed in my family history, but how often do you go to the doctor and the doctor asks, well, what do you do for a living, right? Where do you live? Where do you go to the park or where do you take your evening and afternoon walks? And unfortunately, that's what happened here is there's so much of a lack of science behind so many of these chemicals that are being pumped into our air um, that people just don't know exactly what's causing the issues. And as an individualistic society, uh, we tend to blame ourselves, right? What did I eat? What did I do? I didn't exercise. My family's you know, not the, the best in health. And so that kind of creates its own pressures back where we are less likely to accept information given to us, even if it is from an organization trying to stop the problem. And that's what we are trying to do with Fenceline Watch is address the origin of the problem and not the symptoms, because the symptoms are always gonna make someone money. But as soon as you address the cause of the problem is when you get powerful. And so um, that's why so many people in our communities just don't get involved. It's, it's not having that information or the everyday pressures of increased pay, you know, increased rents, increased food prices. How am I going to put food and gas in my car in order to get to work? I have two, three jobs. And, you know, right now, um, we work out of out of where we live like our entire operation is in the east end in an affordable housing area and so so many of my neighbors just don't have the opportunity or the privilege to be able to to make time to go to a meeting that the state's having and the state will have it monday tuesday wednesday thursday and friday 
any time that you're actually working. So they'll do it before five because as soon as five comes around, they're off the clock. <laughs> Thank you, Yvette. I, I have a lot more questions, but I, uh, I we need to open it up. Uh, our communications coordinator, Janine Walsh, is going to now um, give us some of the questions that have been coming in for you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah, uh, Yvette, so many questions. And we're going to, I'm just going to address the audience for a minute. We will try to get to as many of these as possible. Um, First of all, uh, praise for your story. And and uh, someone in our audience speaks Spanish, so I hope you're able to see some of these comments to you. Um, uh, also, to the audience, we will be providing, someone asked if there's a recording to this, we will be providing links to the films, to Yvette's organization, uh, and to any other uh, resources that would be helpful. We'll be sending out an email tomorrow, so look for that. Um, first off, I wanted to just address, there was mentioned in the film, the, the petrochemical, the, the effective action, the petrochemical plant that was closing down. How long did that take? Or is it still, is that to close down? Is it still online? Are we still waiting? You know, we're still waiting. And unfortunately, the, that plant, because of the boom in plastic production, is going to become a chemical recycling plant for plastics. So plastics to energy project. Hmm. And, uh, you know, if people want to get involved in helping curb the climate crisis right now, I know a lot of folks are hearing about plastic in our oceans, but that plastic is coming from the frack lands of West Texas and is being processed in areas like Houston and, and the Gulf Coast and even Appalachia. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely um, tell folks get involved with the Break Free From Plastic Pollution Act of, of 2021. We're still searching for co-sponsors um, from representatives and as much pressure as we can put there, that would be beneficial because that, uh, that piece of legislation is calling for a halt on facilities that are producing plastics. We have as much plastic as we need from the current existing facilities. Exactly. Creating more of those facilities will make the problem even worse. And the thing is, we're not using them domestically. We're exporting these plastics and they're going to be single use, meaning we're just feeding landfills at this point. Exactly. What was the name of that bill again, Yvette? I'm sorry. Sure. It's the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Of Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Great. We're going to put that in our email follow-up. I hope Michelle is writing it down. <laughs> also, you know, as a follow-up on that, what does justice look like for the communities, especially since you've got ground and uh, water will remain contaminated for generations, even after plants close? How, how does justice look? One is making sure that we're addressing the problem by curbing pollution and also creating jobs mm -hmm. because people need jobs. Sure. And for every single plant that gets closed, uh, we're going to need those replacement jobs to come in. It can't be like what we felt during the automobile uh, crisis. And so creating just transition, Texas, people forget is the number one wind producing state in our country. It is the second most in producing solar power. And so these are the types of infrastructures that new infrastructure bills could feed into offshore wind and solar fields. And in the meantime, make sure that we're closing these facilities down and the current workforce can be used to help shut these facilities down because they're the first and foremost experts. They're gonna know, hey, these chemicals are in here, or this leaks or don't touch that, you know? So let's give them jobs so that they can also feel, hey, I'm helping in this transition. Right. I have this expertise, I can move forward with it. So yeah. that's one thing. And then we do have to address rising waters, right? We're going to have sea level rise and states like California 
We have something called a uh, planned retreat where they're moving away from our coastal waters. And for our vulnerable communities throughout the coast, we're going to need to make sure that that happens safely and as cautiously as possible. We cannot wait for what happened to uh, Pakistan to happen here in the States. We have to be cognizant of this. Wonderfully said, wonderfully put. Um, uh, we had another question about whether or not the EPA or national groups are involved. And also, is there any sort of legal side to this? Can residents sue the chem chemical companies similar to like the asbestos litigation was the question. There's a group of young people uh, that are very, very famous now that lead something called the, the Atmospheric Trust or Our Children's Future. Yes. Mm -hmm. And our children's future is trying to see what it can do to really address future generations issues because we are deaf, they're inheriting this, you know. Um, and so one of the major issues affecting so many of our communities now is groundwater and potable freshwater access. And so we are seeing and feeling current plastic facilities and other petrochemical facilities try and get their hands on freshwater sources. Mm -hmm. Everything from putting up desalinization plants uh, to take salt water out of the sea and then pushing it back out into the sea that's just killing marine life. Uh, and, and honestly, that doesn't need to happen if we curb these uh, facilities from expanding and are able to slowly shut them down and transition over, then we'll have access to more freshwater sources mm -hmm. and we'll stop seeing so many different uh, industries pump waste into the ground that is going to continue contaminating our groundwater sources. Mm -hmm. And so there are different ways that people can get involved if you are a fisherman or if you're part of a fisher folk community, if you uh, do recreation on the water side, every single day on the federal register that is, I'll go ahead and, and put a link in the chat, Every day on the federal register, there are notices that are coming up over specifically fresh water. And what I would love for people to do is be active in the fight against desalinization because all it's going to do is offer a lifeline to production facilities to say, hey, they think they're running out of water. And what we're not saying is we need so much potable water. So the protection of water is one of the easiest ways for folks to get involved. Uh, aside from that, uh, right now, the federal government does have a couple of lifelines out. And one of them is uh, Title VI. You know, we launched a language justice program within our organization because Title VI is very helpful. It's supposed to protect people from, you know, people against discrimination from nationality, uh, from religion, from all of these things. And so if you're able to show that a particular project is affecting a community, for us, our Spanish speaking community didn't have access to this, but within the Franciscan Action Network, we would love to have your support when it comes to helping fight these things from a religious institution uh, because so many churches and spiritual centers are actually on the front lines because when people are being attacked and openly contaminated, the first thing folks do is go towards spirituality. And Absolutely. you see so many centers pop up, but those centers don't get involved. And we would love to see uh, some information that we could even share with them about, you know, what does it say uh, in spiritual texts that we can refer to and say, look, this is a, a part of your spirituality. This is this should be a motivation towards assisting us and stopping these kinds of facilities. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And as Franciscans, we one of our biggest things is relationships. And so that was another comment that someone had made about uh, um, you know, making sure that organizations are not pitted against one another, but in relationship together. So I appreciate those comments, Yvette. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try for one more quick question. What uh, suggestions do you have in educating people about this? Do you have links on your website? Is there a process? I will follow up with all of the links <laughs> that you send me and give me. Definitely. Uh, folks can go to fencelandwatch.org and look at our page to see what's the latest 
things that are coming up, uh, you know, I would say that there are a number of organizations, like I said, the Break Free from Plastic movement is one I always encourage folks to get involved in because it has very individual pieces that people can do everything from uh, doing a brand audit, which is where you start either if you go out and you collect trash just in the neighborhood trying to clean it up, it asks you to log what, who's the trash producer? Is it a Coca-Cola bottle? Is it a Nestle water bottle? Because those logs get collected and then hold corporations accountable. And it's one way that doing a very small act can be magnified at a larger scale. That's so, wonderful. I love that. Okay. And that's on your fencelinewatch.org? Is that what you said? Yes. Um, under our work with, okay. on plastics. So it gotcha. should be petrochemicals and plastic. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But the other, uh, the other thing I'd encourage folks to do is have conversations. You know, you saw the video, sharing that video or sharing a conversation with someone about how you've been affected, how you've heard someone be affected is a, a great way to start the conversation because it's still difficult for me to have those kinds of conversations around the Thanksgiving table, but they need to happen. And the more that folks hear, uh, the more active they're willing to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I could hear the emotion in your voice, you know, when you began this whole uh, uh, conversation with Michelle. So thank you. Thank you. I, I do apologize. Uh, we've kind of run out of time for questions. So thank you everyone for, for entering those questions. Again, you will be getting an email from me tomorrow with a bunch of resources and information. And at this point, I will send it back to Michelle. Um. Thank you so much, Yvette, for your time um, and, um, you know, and, and resources, and, and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. for. There's no gift more precious than the gift of, of the time that you've spent with us to, to educate us. Um, I want to remind everyone that we have three more sessions in this series, the second Thursday of each month. The next one is Thursday, October 13th. We're going to watch the next film in the series, which is about the petrochemical industry in Louisiana. And we will have with us for, for questions and answers, one of the people who appears in that film, Joe Banner, who is the co-founder of the Descendants Project. So please put that on your calendar. And in the follow-up email that you'll get from Janine, will be a way to register for the other uh, uh, webinars if you have not done that already. And so now I would like to ask uh, the president of the Franciscan Action Network, Brother Paul Crawford, to close us with a prayer. O oh God of all creation and Lord of all people, we are grateful for this webinar and especially for Yvette, those who have made this video. And we pray especially tonight for Corinthian that he may be blessed as a victim of environmental racism. And we pray too for his mother, Latoya, and for the people of Ward 5 in Houston. We pray that the hearts of those who profit from these injustices that affect us, but especially affect those who cannot move away or afford protection, will be changed into knowing that it's more profitable for people than for money. May you empower us to contribute, continue this fight with our brothers and sisters. And this we ask in your name, amen. Thank you, Brother Paul. Thank you again, Yvette. And thank you everyone uh, for being with us. We look forward to seeing you at our next session. Bye-bye, peace and all good.